Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our study here from yesterday in dealing with Shamgar in the book of Judges. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have this morning uh, to open your word and to examine the lines and the light that you have given us. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can direct us, that we can understand the things we are studying, and that you can um, correct any error we may have in our thinking. I pray that you can be with each person who is studying these things. Give us wisdom and understanding and the ability to share these things in simple ways with others. May your Holy Spirit uh, give us the words that we need um, in sharing things. Help us to reflect your character in all that we do with all and with whom we come in contact. Be with us now in this study. May your spirit teach each one. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, yesterday we... We finished off uh, Ehud, and we had rearranged uh, the lines dealing with Ehud. Um, and one of the things that we had done, uh, just to go back there, um, is we had recognized that this Revelation 12 sign prophecy where I'm speaking at Lambert Church on September 23rd, 2017, uh, giving a message regarding the prediction before midnight. That That, that is um, July 18. I'm not giving the date, July 18, 2020, just using Samuel Snow's letters, which I was presenting there in September of 2017 in Arkansas. And so this was the sermon that I did at Lambert Church. I did do another sermon at Lambert Church uh, later, dealing with Ezekiel's wheels, um, but the one that I had uh, uh, presented here on September 23rd, 2017, was 777 days prior to November 9th, 2019, um, and it happens to be Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets, and so we use the trumpet being sounded by Ehud to call Ephraim. Uh, to this battle against uh, the Moabites as a um, as a symbol to place this year, and then we put uh, October thirteenth, two thousand eighteen, as um, this uh, the slaying of the ten thousand, which gives us the March twenty seventh symbol in two ways. In that ten thousand days is twenty seven um, years. And point three, with the decimal after that, um, uh, years, right? So the point three representing 273, plus also if we count from November 9th, uh, 2019, or not 2018, it gives us the date, uh, March 27th um, in 2017. So it... It, it gives us the symbol of, of for the Levites. Um, and then we put that this is the arrival of the third message. This is the message regarding time, which then is going to give us um, a measurement going to uh, November 9th, 2019. Um, so that's how we took Ehud, finished off Ehud's um, personal line. But we know that um, Ehud is the second angel's message in this history. So Ehud is a zoom into the second angel's message. But he does uh, end with this third angel's message arriving. Now, we take that Shamgar is the third angel's message. So when we take that into account and we take... Uh, <clears throat> the symbols that are given us, and we laid them out on a line because there isn't much given in Shamgar as far as events. 
All we know is that his name means the sword and that he's the son of, um, uh, I can't think of the guy's name, uh, Anath, right? And Anath means an answer. And, and then it says he slew 600 men. So this, putting this, I mean, as two separate way marks, is just taking this this word here and putting it as the empowerment of the of this message. So this sword is going to answer by killing. Uh, but then 600 men, and we haven't really dealt completely with this. We know that it's a period of um, one year, and I believe it was like 138 days or something like that. Let me see here, 600. So it was one year. And oh, I did that wrong. So let me go back here. This mistake. Sorry about that. I'm just going to do this again. Two hundred and thirty-five. Oh, two hundred and thirty-five days. Okay. Now, what's two thirty-five? So it's 234.75, but what's 235 days? What's 235 as a symbol? Uh, let's put it that way. Twenty third day of the fifth month. Okay. Um, how many months are there in a metonic cycle? Two thirty five. Yeah. So there's. I don't know why. Six hundred. Well, yeah, two hundred thirty five. But that's in the that's in a seven year metonic cycle or nineteen uh, nineteen year metonic cycle. Right. So, so as the symbol, two thirty five represents what does what does a metonic cycle represent? Nineteen years, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so it's one year and two hundred and thirty five days. Two hundred and thirty five days represents nineteen years. Uh, or 235 represents 19 years as a symbol. We know from uh, the dividing of the kingdom in six or 977 to um, the beginning of the 19 years, that is in 470 or 742 BC, is 235 years, and then 19 years, which is symbolically 235 months, uh, that's going to go to um, the captivity of. Um, Hoshea, right, in 723 BC. So, so if we're going to take this, if we're going to do this, if we're going to take this as a symbol, 600 men, now it becoming a symbol, um, what is it symbolizing? That would relate to the message of Shamgar. So Shamgar is... We're placing it uh, at the, as here, a zoom into the arrival of the third angel's message. Right. So, just as Ehud was a zoom into the arrival of the second, and Othniel is into the arrival of the first, Shamgar is referring to this third message, and this third message has to do with chronology. 
but we're going to also lay these events out that this is the progression of way marks that address the arrival of the third angel's message. And we have the second angel here being symbolized by 600 men, which gives us this symbol of one year and 235 days. That is 365 plus 235 gives us 600. could do it that way. So here we have a symbol for a year and a symbol for a metonic cycle. And, and we haven't put any dates here yet to what this, how we're going to address the Lion of Shamgar. And so we have to consider each of these symbols, the sword, the answer, the slew, the killing, right? The 600 men themselves, um, the ox, which refers to the plowing, um, which we would take as line upon line, um, and then the goad, which means to teach or instruct. And then he delivered Israel. And, and that word delivers means open. That's one of the meanings of it. So, so we have to then somehow see if we can fit this in. <clears throat> um, so that word yasha, which is translated as delivered, means to be open wide or free so so that symbol there would have to relate to some event in our history that we could tie to uh, the understanding of chronology so is it clear what what it is we're trying to do here we have all these question marks we don't have any dates for these way marks So somebody's going to have to start uh, with this. We have to figure out what we can do with this. Since we're looking at the arrival of the third angel's message under this with Shamgar. Yeah. Can, would it be possible that that arrival would line up with, <clears throat> with what we've seen from 2020 with the message about Nashville? No. Okay. Because yes. the way that we're understanding these lines is um, Ehud, Othniel, and, and Shamgar all are really the arrival of the first angels in the, the judge's line, leading to the formalization of the message in the judge's line, right? So the formalization of the message is going to be, we have here October 13th, 2018, and September 7th, 2019. So... And, and and I never really expounded why I put these two dates here, but this has to do with Deborah and Barak and the symbols that are there.
Okay, 235 divided by 600 equals 391.6666666.391666. Right, so that's interesting. Okay, so that might help us a little bit, um, especially when we consider the 391 and the proclamation of the 391 in this movement. So anyway, that means that we're when we're looking at this history of e Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, it's addressing this history in the movement. It's not going through the entire line, though it does relate to it, right? But it, it's mostly applying to the first angel's message. But each of these lines has their own line, right, which has a third message in it. So it's a three-step testing prophetic message that relates specifically to the chronology that's introduced here in October 22, 2014. Well, in October of 2014, right? Because we're going to recognize that, that this is about the chronology being introduced into this message at that camp meeting in Arkansas. But, but that I, I understand how how we can look at this. So, so any other thoughts, Dwight? Because I, I mean, these symbols here have to be the main thing that that we're addressing. So we need to know what the darkness is for one, and we're saying that Shamgar represents specifically um, a chronology something to do with chronology. Ehud had to do with the 2520 coming into this message. But we can see in that in that first angel's message of the big judge's line, there's a lot that comes in dealing with 9-11. And so when we zoom into 9-11, we can see that we have um, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. This is the work of the Holy Spirit the 2520, and then specifically from that, this new message, this new look at chronology that's being introduced into the movement. It's a much more detailed chronology. And then we have these symbols, right? But we, we need to know specifically what this darkness is. Um, all we know is it's the Philistines, right? So what are the Philistines going to represent What have they represented to us in understanding the lines? Literally, they were destructive people from the West. Yeah. And they have represented a method of study, have they not? Correct. Okay. And, and that method of study would be a, a Protestant method of study. Right, because if, if they were if they were representative from the East, that would be a different a different situation all, altogether. Mm -hmm. But because the Philistines are coming from the West, they are facing the sun. Okay. So their, their method of study is not as the light would come from God. It is as the light would come from man. Yeah. So I agree, you know, this would be the Protestant method of study. Okay. So, so that means within this movement, there is a reform line that addresses chronology that is a Protestant understanding. Right. Okay. Now, one of the things, because <laughs> this line, of course, addressed a lot of my history, um, because I'm the one who introduced this chronology. Now, prior to this, and, and I'm, it was at Lambert Church in 2014, um, Dwayne Dewey did some presentations. 
Now, I also know he did some presentations um, in 2012. We actually had a camp meeting in uh, British Columbia that was put on by um, Jonah and Michelle. And we, we went to that camp meeting. Um, and then we had, we had a, a fall camp meeting here in October of 2012, um, following that. And then we had our, our summer camp meeting in 2013 here. So the first camp meeting we had in Canada was in, in 2012 in the summer. And I don't know the dates of that specifically. Uh, I could probably find out from the photos I took. But um, anyway, the speakers were Dwayne Dewey and um, Leo. And Dwayne Dewey was, he would write out when he did his presentations, and some people may remember this, he would write out this, this line of chronology. And he would have, you know, uh, Daniel's captivity in 606 and um, <clears throat> uh, the decree of of Cyrus in 536, which was correct. Um, but he had a lot of wrong dates um, in, in his line. Um, and so when I came along in 2014 and I presented different dates, uh, there was a lot of resistance to that um, by, by Dwayne Dewey himself. And, and by others. And we know that the third year of Jehoiakim goes from the fall of 607 to the fall of 606. But Dwayne Dewey was just accepting a lot of understanding of chronology that hadn't been examined. That is, Adventism inherited chronology from others, but we hadn't examined it. And, and one is it's it's a huge job, right? I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a simple process, and it's and it still is difficult um, addressing some of these assumptions that people have made regarding uh, the kings of of Judah, how we count their reigns, you know, what year the temple was built, you know, Solomon's temple, what year it was destroyed. Uh, these are things that people don't agree on, and we have kind of a patchwork quilt of chronology so to speak that is we we take pick and choose different chronological systems uh, that are inconsistent with each other and we put them together to get our chronology and and we don't realize we're doing that so the thing that i had to do in addressing chronology was really to dig into this in a much more detailed way so that I could be satisfied that we had the correct chronology and that we uh, weren't doing um, a disservice to God's word, that we weren't uh, dismissing statements in the Bible because they didn't fit in or reinterpreting statements in the Bible because they didn't fit in with our system. Um, and one of the things we see about the Protestants, if we're going to take um, Isaiah 28, is basically this regurgitation of that which was given to us right that's the 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 wine the strong drink right this is a problem that this movement had that is our movement chronologically speaking was, was not founded on a solid foundation we had actually had a foundation that had all kinds of assumptions, all kinds of Protestant thinking. So in other words, our foundation was built with slime and mortar. Yes. Now, we have addressed that in um, when we were uh, studying some of the other lines. Um, and uh, I believe some of the other studies that we had addressed. I can't remember specifically. Um, I think it was in Ezekiel, but I'm, I could be wrong. Um, Cause I don't remember the details, but 
anyway, the point is, when it comes to what was introduced into this movement, um, it was something that could not have been introduced into this movement, movement previously. That is, even when we looked at um, the pioneers of Adventism, um, there were, were problems with their chronology. Now, God led them, so the foundation of prophecy was laid down correctly. And, and it's almost as if by accident that they happened to get the correct dates. That is, they had information that contradicted itself, but they used that information to produce the dates we have. So these things were given us, right? God gave um, the commencement of the chain of truth to William Miller. And, and we have a similar thing with Jeff as well, because God gave Jeff an understanding of, of things that as we continue to study it, we continue to refine it. So what God has given us, we don't reject. But the reasoning behind things or the information or the details behind things, those have been refined to show that the foundation was laid correctly. So I don't want to, you know, give the impression somehow the foundation was laid incorrectly. I'm just saying that there were um, chronological details in our understanding of things that just were passed down to us. And we never examined them. So we know Ellen White has the vision about people examining the foundation. Right. They step off the platform. They look at the foundation and see it was laid correctly. And we believe that it was laid correctly. Where others who question the, the foundation no longer stand upon it. Right. That is, they abandon the foundation, believing that it was laid incorrectly because there are details or things they can't explain. Right. OK. So, so we know that there are problems, that, that things we don't understand. But we've seen Adventists looking at the foundation and then saying, oh, it's, it's, we're, we're just going to have to abandon the 2300 days. Uh, the Protestants now understand chronology better than we did. And, you know, Miller was just an uneducated farmer. And so he made all these mistakes. But, you know, he... He gave us an understanding of things that led to the development of this movement. Um, so the development of this movement was important, but we, we don't need his understanding. We, we have a better understanding. Um, so they reject the foundation where this movement accepts that the foundation was laid correctly, even though some details um, are incorrect. But as we examine the details, it supports the structure that was laid down. So we could state it that way, right? We, we keep the 2300 days, we keep the 70 weeks, we keep the 2520, we keep the 1335, the 1290, the 1260. Um, we keep an understanding of of the daily and the two desolating powers. But we understand some of the details or the support for these periods to be slightly different. You know, even, even in the recognition now that it's December 25th, 508, that Clovis is baptized and not uh, what they had 496 or something before, that he's, he's gonna be baptized 12 years later than uh, people used to believe. But now we know that that actually fits in with our lines better. So, so it is a bit of, uh, you know, for some people, if you just change any little detail, they believe that you're rejecting the foundation. A good example of this would be on the 1843 chart. So on the 1843 chart, when they made the chart, um, 
when did they believe that the year 1843 began and ended? At the time the chart was made in 1842. If I understood your question, didn't they believe that this was going to be sometime in the spring of 1843? When the chart was made? No, the chart was made in 1842. I know no, that. But when the chart was made and they put the year 1843 on the chart, uh, they believed that this was the, the eight, year 1843 began when? In the spring of the year. No, they didn't. So it's not until December of 1842 that William Miller... Uh, decides or comes to understand or presents the idea at least um, that the Jew that, that the year 1843 is going to be a Jewish year beginning in the spring of 1842 or or um, the spring of 1843 ending in the spring of 1844. So when they made the chart, the year 1843 went from January 1st to December 31st. Okay. But they, they could look at this chart and then modify their understanding of it after the chart was made. And then, and when they, when they address this problem, they talked about the fullness of the year. So this isn't something that comes after the first disappointment. This occurs prior to. So the idea that the year could include, the year 1843, could include parts of the year 1844 had to do with the full year. So you're going to see this in 1843. They're going to be talking about the full year. Now, I'm not sure who it was in this movement, but I think it would either have been Dwayne Dewey, and I think that's who it was, or someone else, who tried to argue that, there, the, that the mistake on the chart <clears throat> had to do with the fullness of the year. And when I first heard about this, um, that it had nothing to do with there being no zero year, I was, I was completely baffled what people were talking about. And so I actually researched it and wrote a paper on it, the full year and the no zero year. And, and so the mistake on the chart, the mistake that they had um, corrected regarding the zero year was corrected in 1843. They even started to understand this in 1842 as well. So, um, so that wasn't the mistake that they no noticed after the first disappointment, neither of them. It wasn't like after the first disappointment, they said, oh, you know, we forgot that there was no zero year. Right. And so now we're going to change it to 1844 or, you know, we didn't recognize the fullness of the year and now we, we need to. That didn't happen in 1844. That happened in 1843 and 1842. Okay. Now, when we look on the chart and we see 538 for the fall of Babylon, when would they consider the year 538 to, to be? So we know that the figures were as God wanted them. Now, when did Babylon fall? In the fall of 538. No, in the fall of 539, October 13th, 539. Okay. So so when we look at 538 on the chart, that's a Jew, that's a civil year. So we know that 1843, because 1843, as far as <clears throat> the 1335 is concerned, right? Because that's what's going to be really at the bottom of the chart is the 1290 and the 1335. 
uh, they're going to end at the end of the Jewish year, 1843, which is going to be April 18th at sunset, technically. <clears throat> right? Right. Okay. So, so though that 1843 in the bottom of the chart, which we can't actually see here, but at the bottom of the chart is correct. The only 1843s that are wrong are the two up at the top right-hand corner with the 2300 days and the 2520. Those actually refer to something that happens not at the end of the Jewish year, 1843, but at in, in the... Uh, the fall of 1844, which is, you know, a different year. And that's because of the fact that there is no zero year, but there is a zero in the math, right? So God held his hand over the mistake in the figures there. <clears throat> so he didn't have two hands, one at the bottom and one at the top. He just had the hand held over the right-hand corner. <clears throat> with those 1843 mistakes, correct? Agreed. Yeah, so so when Jerusalem, or when Babylon falls on October 13th, it's gonna be the 16th day of the seventh month. So it's in the fall, that is, it's in a Jewish year that starts in the fall of 539 and ends in the fall of 538. So 538 there represents a civil year but 1843 at the bottom of the chart represents a religious year. And so we can see that this understanding that there is, that the chart is as God wanted them, neither of those are a mistake. 538 uh, BC there for the fall of Babylon, right below 677, and 1843 at the bottom of the chart are not mistakes. Right, so you get there. See, so those 1843s at the bottom, those are correct because that's the end of the Jewish year, 1843. So that means built into this chart was, uh, without man's design, was two different ways of counting the year, a civil and a religious way. But you can see how people, when somebody like me comes along and says, well, we know that Babylon fell on October 13th, 539 BC, that people would say that I'm rejecting the chronology of the charts. So this was a big issue for people like uh, Tanya Beeman and some of the um, people who were following um, <clears throat> Mark Bruce. And, and also, though I never had a discussion with him about 538, but it would have been Dwayne Dewey as well would have had trouble with that right <clears throat> so what was being given this movement in regard to chronology was a refinement process it wasn't a rejection of the foundation that was laid do we do we do we see that that the millerites themselves did a refining process as they moved along. <clears throat> so they refined the 1843 chart with the idea of the full year so that they could retain the chart because because they already understood, you know, that the two things are the same. The idea of the full year and that there's no zero year to the Millerites was the same problem. So they didn't just say, oh, you know, we're just going to change all those dates that go from BC to AD and add one year. They actually have this sort of creative solution to address the full year. Um, but it still is because they're, they didn't consider the fact that there was no zero year. Otherwise, they would have had 1844 at the bottom of the chart if they had considered that. Right? And makes sense to people? Logical. Yeah. Okay. 
But you can see that this has all been a refining of the chronology. So with Shamgar, I mean, this represents this refining of chronology that's going to happen in connection with this movement as part of really the formalization, because the arrival of the third angel here is going to have to do with the formalization of our understanding in regard to um, this line from 9-11 to 2023, right? So this line up here, the judge's line, all of this is this increase of light represented by Othniel, the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, Ehud, the 2520, and Shamgar dealing with chronology. And this is going to come to a head in the formalization of this message with Deborah and Barak. That is, this is going to, um, not with Deborah and Barak, but in the story of Deborah and Barak, with Sisera, right, which is going to be Parminder. So this movement has two aspects here, Deborah and Barak. One a woman, one a man. <clears throat> and so once we get this Shamgar sorted out, then we can understand this better. And, and we have done that. We just haven't put Shamgar on a line yet. <clears throat> now with Othniel, we never really did a refined line. That is, we didn't give the events um, dates. We just, we just recognized that this was a work of the Holy Spirit in preparing this movement to receive light and that this is 9-11, it's, it's waking us up. And so we didn't lay out a bunch of dates. And we could argue here, well, we don't need to with Shamgar. You know, we could just say, this is just this arrival of this message of chronology uh, to this movement. But I think we can take this line and look at the symbols that are being used here. <clears throat> uh, to give specific dates. Now, some of these dates are, people are not going to know because some of them have to do with things that aren't really public knowledge. They have to do with the development of the understanding of chronology. But we look at a symbol of a sword. <clears throat> So let's just look at each of these symbols. Sword. So first we have a sword. And this is going to be the arrival of the first angel's message. And so what would a sword represent? Um, what things does it represent? And how could we take this sword and place it as a date, as the arrival of this first message re relating to chronology? Okay, so what's a sword represent? Okay, so the word of God. Yeah, the word of God. I I would put it where you first spoke of it at, at FFA, I guess. When I I I don't know was that was was that with the Samuel Snow stuff? Sorry, my okay. memory is not the greatest. So this I put it earlier than that, right? So okay. <clears throat> So that's, that's part of the thing is a lot of you don't know this history. Um, no. Right. So, but, but it is the word of God. And so, um, put an extra period there. But one of the things that we're looking at is this relates to line upon line, right? Very much. So the, this sword is a two-edged sword. It's 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 one line upon another. Okay, that's an interesting way of putting the symbol. Yeah. Okay. So there's two lines, two edges. So it's it's parallel, right? You got this sword. Now, um, this sword, we don't, I mean, it's, it's not describing an actual sword. It's just the name of, of Shamgar. What it means is a sword. 
um, name denotes character, right? So we could maybe address that a bit. I don't know. But it, it is this sharp edge. It's two-edged sword. It's God's word. And, and what does God's word do, this two-edged sword, according to the scriptures? Cuts to the heart. Okay, it divides asunder soul and spirit and joints and marrow. So what is that? Kind of the foundation of man. Okay, well, how do you divide soul and spirit and joints and marrow? What, what are you doing if you're doing that? Wouldn't you be being very particular? You could say that, yes. Because okay. a surgeon can, you know, divide joints and marrow. Uh, but, you know, he does this with uh, a scalpel. But really, in, in a sense, there are things almost that can't be decided or discerned. Um, now, what comes to me, sorry, what comes to me is a statement about the great cleaver of truth. Okay. Yeah, so this is God's word examining things in detail. And, and the tool that's given us in God's word is precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, right? To set in order on a line from here to there. It's line upon line. Now, in relationship to the chronology message, that's going to be uh, a presentation that occurs on October 5th. Oh, so we'll put this here, October 5th. Um, 2012. Right, so he had, and so Iran put a verse there from Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Right, so we have the sharp two-edged sword. And I'm saying that this represents this God's word in this line upon line fashion. And there is also a sense in which uh, this two edged sword, um, when we see soul and spirit, um, that it divides soul and spirit. I mean, what does that mean? What's the difference between soul and spirit, scripturally speaking? Well, I'm thinking of the breath of life plus plus the mind, but I mean, I don't know Greek and I haven't looked up what those words are derived from. Soul okay. and spirit. We know, yeah. So we know biblically man became a living soul. That refers to the whole being of man, right? The soul. Right. Okay. Um, now, um, now, where's the verse? It's in Hebrews. I know that. I mean, I could look it up quickly. Somebody remember the reference for this? The word of God is quick and powerful. It's Hebrews 4.12. Okay. I thought it was in Hebrews 4.12, but. Oh, I see. I went too far down. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, so here we can see that God's word um, defines things. And Iran says that's Bible verse 
30,027. So it's a symbol of 327. Um, so 273. Um, but here we can see that the soul is really the whole life of a person, but the spirit is um, you know, spiritual things, and in a sense, you could say spiritual and literal, you know, figurative and and literal. That when we're studying God's word, that we're not just addressing, um, when we're using God's word to examine truth, we're understanding things both spiritually and literally. So there, there's an understanding that's going on here that is being um, <clears throat> introduced into the study of these lines that is um, is is for lack of a better word deeper than what had been done before. It's more precise. It's more accurate. It's um, We're, we're using the tool that God has given us line upon line in a way that we hadn't previously. We're going to be looking at the chronology, the dates, the symbols, right? So that is, we take a date and we don't just look at it as a date in a history. It becomes a symbol, right? Right. The spans of time between dates become symbols, and this is really being introduced in, in this message at this time. Now, now, Jeff has done it, and of course it exists within Adventism. Every Adventist, at least they used to, you know, they look at 70 AD for the destruction of Jerusalem and see in it a symbol of probation, right? 70 is a symbol of probation, like the 70 weeks. So 70 AD is a symbol there. And they wouldn't think that that's just a cool coincidence they would say you know that was god's design but we we take this m much further we can even take um all of these dates whether it's a biblical date an islamic date a mayan date whether it's a date on the the papal or the pagan uh roman calendars and they become symbols right we can take all of these these numbers and they become symbols. They, they become meaningful. And this really happens as a result of this line upon line. This use of God's word as a sword um, is also referencing the idea that it's a discerner of the, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This message is going to be a dividing message. And it's meant to bring uh, conviction. And it's going to bring about um, a division in the movement. Now, I put October 5th, 2012, because that's the camp meeting that we had in Alberta, the first camp meeting in Alberta, the first one that I presented at. And I'm going to present line upon line. I'm going to do a, a study of how we look at um, line upon line. So that's my first presentation. That's a Friday morning, I believe. Uh, the camp meeting started Thursday night. We had, um, I can't remember if it was Jamal Sankey or Roland Temple who presented the first night, uh, but they were both there. And um, uh, so we're going to have, yeah, it's going to be the Friday morning. I do my first presentation. I do a presentation Friday, Sabbath, and Sunday morning three presentations of the line upon line. And uh, <clears throat> so, so that October 5th, 2012 date is a date that I have in my line, in my personal line, but I believe it exists here in this line. And that this movement is now introduced to a new way, even though we had line upon line before, this is going to be a refining process. 
And then we're going to have an increase of knowledge that comes here. Now, some of these I might have a hard time giving a specific date. Um, but we have an answer. So we have the sword, but he's the son of an answer. So what would the answer represent? And I mean, and obviously here, these are just tentative lines. You know, we're drawing these things out. You know, I'm picking this date that people don't know anything about. But we're now going to have an answer. It's going to be the formalization of a message. Well, what was the main query at that time? Okay. So, so we're going to look at this darkness. This has to do with the method of study, right? And now it's going to be introduced solidly line upon line. This message of line upon line uh, comes about. And, and so there needs to be an answer, in a sense, to this. And so we'd have to figure out what, what is the answer to this, this question of inquiry, I guess. So at this point, you know, um, this is just the Canadian group, really, that's affected by this study. So, you know, this isn't, um, you know, this is not being presented in Arkansas or anything. But I, I do this first presentation. So it's going to come to an empowerment. And so, so we have here a formalization of a message. So this message arrives, um, but a formalization is what? What is the formalization? A recognition of the message. Okay, so some kind of recognition. It's it's different than an empowerment, right? Uh, you know, sometimes it's the packaging of the message in a particular way. Now, here, you know, because people don't necessarily know all the stuff that goes on in my personal life here. But in 2011, um, I'm going to be in Oregon. I'm going to see a presentation. And that's going to be the first time I understand the 2520. Um, and, you know, I could put, you know, like we have lots of other dates here. I mean, I was in Oklahoma in 2010, um, you know, and I could just put it when I first encounter this message. So that's another option. Um, so I could make this almost like my personal line within this message um, leading up to uh, this confrontation that we're going to have in 2018. Um, so I could do that, but I'm looking at, at this sword that's introduced, right? So that's why I'm taking October 5th, 2012. rather than when I first come to understand um, the 2520 or anything like that. Now, in this period of time, too, I'm also um, presenting the 2520 prophetic mirror in 2012. So I, I developed this mirror in much more detail than we had before. But I'm going to uh, present this in uh, the camp meeting in uh, Sylvan Lake, Alberta. That's going to be the camp meeting where Jeff and I both present the four seven times. So that's going to end up on this line somewhere. There's also going to be um, the presentations from 2014. Those are going to be on this line somewhere. And, and I believe that this line is going to lead us to um, 
the confrontation that occurs in 2018. So, so what I could do is I could put here um, October 13th, 2018. So that's going to be where we present the 391. I could put that there. But, you know, I'm actually more inclined to put this somewhere else. And, and that's partly because of this. So what I would do, and this is just tentatively, but I would put the presentation and here specifically August 31st, uh, 2013. So this is gonna be another presentation. So we're gonna look at these, the Shamgar message as presentations. So this presentation is gonna be on the 2520. Uh, this is also the day that I do the calculation of regarding the first day of the fifth month. And then uh, we're going to have an empowerment of this. Um, I'll do it here. This is going to be uh, the presentation of this message. So this is an answer. So, so why would I put this as an answer? Because there is a question that is proposed here. That is, Jeff is going to ask us what to do with um, uh, the first day of the fifth month in Ezra 7-9, in the first day of the first month. Now, I'm doing a presentation on the 2520, but what's more important here is the answer. So how does the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month and the answer, answer that I give, um, how does that relate to what's happening here as far as this is the Philistines, right? The Protestant understanding. And I present line upon line and this being formalized by this answer to Jeff's question. Now, remember, I'm, I'm using my personal experience here. I mean, somebody could say, well, the, Jeff asked the question here in 2013. So the answer is going to be given in 2014 on June 22nd, 2014. Right? That is, Noel's going to answer that question, you know, to the movement. And, and maybe in some ways that would be a better approach than how I'm looking at it in applying this just to my own personal understanding. But I'm connecting it because of uh, the events that happen in, in my experience. Maybe that's not the best way to do it. But this was a really important question. So obviously Ezra 7-9 is important. And for me to, to introduce the idea to Jeff that the Jewish months are 29 and 30 days alternatingly, rather than being all 30 days each, as Jeff had understood it. This becomes important, right? Yes. Okay, so so we could say it's a formalization of the message of line upon line as well, because now we're taking Millerite history and we're lining it up uh, with the events of 457 BC, which also are going to relate to our own time. So if this is the case, the empowerment of this would be in 2014. So, so we could put here, so again, you know, these are just us thinking, 
we've changed some of our minds before. But if, if I put here June 22nd, 2014, that would be Noel, right? Okay. So Noel's going to, he's going to take this and empower this. When he draws out the first day of the first month to the, uh, to the first day of the fifth month and having October uh, 22nd, there's the 10th day of the seventh month. This now is a ref refinement of this line upon line chronology that I would say is an empowerment of this message of chronology. Because for the first time, we're starting to be very particular in this movement regarding dates. Right, dates in Millerite history and dates in 457 BC. Uh, yeah, so uh, Noel's name is, uh, of course, referring to Christmas. So that's December 25th. So how would that relate then as far as the line is concerned? So Noel, right, means the first Noel has to do with Christmas. Because is this going to relate to, is this understanding of these lines here going to end up giving us an understanding of the 20, uh, 25th of December in 2021, for instance. Oh, I'm thinking of Clovis being baptized on that date in 508 mm -hmm. and you being baptized on that date later. 82. Right? Yeah. 82. Okay. Well, obviously later than 508. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was so. baptized after. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So Noel has this symbol of, of the 25th of December. Now, June 22nd, 2014, that's going to be the beginning of this camp meeting in 2014. And we know June 22nd relates to Samuel Snow's letters, the Pentecost um, letter, right? On the sixth day of the third month on the Jewish calendar in 1844. There's 187 days from June 22nd to December 25th. Okay, so, and I was actually just gonna do that when, uh, <laughs> yeah, and that that's that's an account that's inclusive, right? So that's not a cardinal count from June 22nd. That would be exactly how you count from the first day of the first month. 187 days to the 10th day of the seventh month. So this June 22nd date in 2014, uh, it's obviously very important as a symbol of July 18 and of the 25th of December. Now, we know it also relates to Jehoiachin, because Jehoiachin is released from pr prison on the 25th day of the, the 12th month. So June 22nd, 2014 is the camp meeting, the first camp meeting in Arkansas. So Samuel's asking that question. And so Jeff had noted that on June 
June 22nd, 2011, he received $165,000 to start the School of the Prophets. In June 22nd, 2014, they're going to have their first camp meeting in Arkansas after being in Arkansas, because obviously Ozone was in Arkansas in 2004. But this is just, um, you know, unrelated to, because I'm not sure when Jeff moved there to Arkansas. I think he moved there because of um, these camp meetings they had in Ozone. But anyway, so June uh, 22nd, 2011 to June 22nd, 2014 um, is going to be um, uh, this period of time that Jeff notes, these three years. Now, the center date of that is um, December 21st, 2012. And that's going to be uh, that Mayan date. So that June 22nd, 2014 date has its connection of connecting December 21st, 2012, uh, which starts a 777 chiasm with four different periods of 777 days and 100 83 days in the center with June 22nd as the center date in 2017. Um, so June 22nd is a symbol of FFA that we, we understand it that way. And um, it's 187 days before December 25th. In inclusive count or an ordinal count it would be the 187th day. So we can see that, that that fits in here somewhere, whether this is the best place to place this way mark, um, but we're gonna place it with the slew, right? And, and what's the significance then of how would we relate this to the slewing? We, we already have some of the hints there from these symbols. So your question is, how do we relate this to the slaying that occurred? Yeah, the, the killing of the Philistines. Right. Since this is the use of a double-edged sword, and we've already applied that double-edged sword to the Bible, is this not the acceptance of Miller's rules and the instructions that we have for proper biblical study well yes so so we so would this, yeah. th this would be the destruction then of the method of study that is in error okay yeah now it's it so so this has to do with the method of study and and elements of the method of study First off, when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, I read the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. Right. So that's going to be one of the first things you do when you become an Adventist, right? So you're going to read this commentary, and you're going to find that one thing they say about how to study the Bible is that we do not use uh, symbolic we don't take the histories of the Bible, the stories of the Bible, and look for hidden meanings in things. We're not going to take dates and numbers uh, because that's all just um, Jewish mysticism. Right? I'm listening. Yeah. So we know that, that Adventist scholarship would not accept what we're doing with dates and spans of time and numbers and taking a story like the story of Shamgar and saying that this represents our history. They would never do this. So, so we're doing something, we're introducing something. And, and there were people that were upset with me doing this in this movement, um, they they saw the use of numbers as numerology, right? 
So even though Jeff was using numbers, they sort of overlooked it, I guess, or, you know, they just allowed him to do it. And, um, but they didn't like what was happening. And mostly just because it didn't fit in with their understanding of things. Because, you know, they were using symbolic use of numbers too, but in a, in a limited way. So, so what we're doing here right now would not be accepted. Um, but this June 22nd, 2014 date, when at this camp meeting, Noel is going to lay out this parallel between the dates in Millerite history and the dates in 457 BC, that it's now going to represent, you know, for instance, the first day of the fifth month representing um, the midnight cry, you know, August, August uh, 15th, 1844. I mean, this is going to be really open up the doors, this understanding of things for what's going to follow. And um, so just to kind of finish this off, we'll come back to this tomorrow. But here's what I would do. So I would take what we've discussed and I would look at this 600 men. Now, I understand this as a symbol of, of a year plus the symbol for the Metonic cycle. And, and this has to do with chronology. This has to do with the symbols that I was understanding. I also present uh, 391 and a half years for the kings of Judah from Rehoboam to the end of Zedekiah's reign. So I'm going to present that here. That is, I figured out the chronology of the kings of Judah and, and I'm going to present, I, I don't at this time in 2014, that is, this is going to be October 21st to or 20th, pardon me, to 21st, uh, 2014. But this is me now uh, presenting this message to the movement in general. I mean, Jeff had heard it um, in uh, July of 2014, invites me to this camp meeting. So I'm going to present. And I present things like the Metonic Cycle. I present um, uh, the, the 391.0. 0.5 for the kings of Judah. Um, now, and, and that's going to come from the symbol of the 600 men. So we can see how these two are connected. These are both 2014 and these are connected. But now arrives to this movement, this, this foundation that's been laid with uh, this understanding of line upon line and the understanding of um, how this relates to Ezra 7, 9, then we're now going to have introduced a new message of chronology, specifically addressing uh, the details of, of chronology. Just, it's, it's going to be much more detailed and, and it's going to upset the cart, so to speak, um, regarding some of the what we had accepted uh, regarding dates. So this is going to be a re-examination of these dates. Now, we're going to have then this ox that's mentioned, this ox goad. And this is going to be this plowing of these lines that happen in the summer of 2016. So this is just me, you know. Um, so this is going to be me and Stephen um, going over the chronology. Um, this is where we. Uh, this is where I'm going to present Ezekiel and um, and and here I'm going to enter in uh, introduce the 391 and a half for the kings of Judah, but now I'm going to have the starting points and the end points for the 390. So Ezekiel four, verse four to six. I now have um, 
the prophecy of Josiah that connects these two. Um, and probably I could even just give, give a date here. This would be July uh, 16th, whoops, uh, 2016. So this is the sermon that Jeff is then, so this would be a formalization of this message. Jeff is going to take that DVD of that sermon that was done at, Lam well, it was supposed to be done a sermon at Lambert Church. It ended up being on the Lambert website because it was the Sabbath sermon, but the power was uh, out in Arkansas, at, but not at the school. And so we were able to have church there at the school instead of at Lambert. Otherwise, it would have been at Lambert. But if the power had been on, hadn't gone out, it wouldn't have been me speaking. It would have been, again, I did that. It would have been uh, Daniel from Brazil. So Jet Daniel from Brazil asked me to, what am I doing here? 16, there we go. Daniel from Brazil asked me to speak because his the power had been out for a couple of days and he was unable to do his translation work to present a sermon. So I ended up presenting instead of him and presenting at the School of the Prophets instead of Lambert. So now we say that this is the ox and that this is a plowing. This is placing a line upon line. And, and what else would the ox represent? Well, there's a verse that says, muzzle not the ox that treads out the corn. Okay. A sacrificial animal. Okay, a sacrificial animal. Can we relate this at all to Ezekiel? You have the faces. Yeah, so you have the faces in in uh, Ezekiel chapter one and chapter six, right? The four chapter living 10. creatures, right? What's that? Chapter ten. Chapter ten, right? I'm getting confused with Isaiah six. Okay, chapter ten. So Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10 have the four living creatures. And, and one of them has the face of an ox, right? So maybe that's a bit of a stretch. Um, but we can see that this symbol here. Okay. Um, and then we have... Um, so we have the symbol of the ox, but we can also see that this is going to be this plowing, this line upon line expanded. Uh, so what Stephen and I do in connection with um, uh, the story of uh, Joseph and how Stephen asked me to count, uh, because we find the 1,764 years, and he asked me to count back from 34 AD, 1764 years, and we come to the when when we come to the um, Jacob blessing his twelve sons, right at the, in the year of his death. So we have this whole structure then that um, that comes as a result, and so this would be uh, this formalization of this message, and it's also now going to be accepted within the movement. That is, what I present in 2014, um, people walk out. You know, people say this is a waste of their time. But in this presentation on July 16th, 2016, that's going to be something that then is um, a general acceptance. Not, not everyone accepts what I'm doing, but there's this general acceptance regarding um, Ezekiel and this chronology. And Jeff says that there's going to be a lot more light coming from Ezekiel. Now, the movement gets a little bit sidetracked right after this because we're then going to have um, all of this uh, parallels of the kings, of the Roman kings and different things that we go into plus the division that, that develops. 
uh, after 2016. So, so there's a lot of things that go on uh, because of what happens in 2016. And then we have uh, this here, and I would just put it as um, So this is going to be September 23rd, 2017. I'll just do it shorter. And this is going to be the, uh, me in Lambert Church. So again, these are two Lambert sermons, so to speak, even though this one's technically not in Lambert. Um, but that's going to be me presenting July 18 as the symbol of the prediction before midnight. Plus, I'm there in September of 2017 for the first time as a teacher in the movement. So, I mean, I did some presentations in 2016 and 2014, but here I'm actually invited to teach for three weeks at the School of the Prophets. And so that's going to sort of culminate in this uh, presentation here on September 23rd, 2017. Um, and then in October 13th, 2018, that's going to be me calculating uh, the 391.5. And now this has to do with delivered. Now the word delivers means to open, to be open, to be free. So maybe I'll put it here. So how would we relate that then to what happens with the confirmation of November 9th, 2019, by the calculation that's done there, based upon, of course, this 391.5 that was introduced here. How would, how would we characterize this? So you have tests 10 days before presenting of two presentations, Midnight, Midnight Cry, and um, um, what was the other one called? 10 days. 10 days, right. Yeah, 10 years. So it's 10 days earlier she presents a presentation called 10 years. And... Um, and then another one on called the Midnight Cry. And that's where she introduces November 9th, 2019. So 10 days later, after her 10 years presentation, I confirm that 391.5 days from noon, October 13th, brings me to November 9th, 2019. And, and so how does this relate to delivering? To be open. To be free. See, so the definition in Brown Drivers Briggs is, um, let's see here. To save, be saved, be delivered, to be liberated, be saved, delivered, to be saved in battle, be victorious, to save, deliver, to save from moral troubles, to give victory to, right? And in the Strongs, it says um, a primitive root properly to be open, wide or free, that is by implication to be saved causatively to free or help. So that's if you're got an active verb, um, avenging, defend, deliver, help, preserve, rescue, be safe, bring salvation, or having salvation, save, savior, get victory. So it has these different uh, ways in which it's used, but the idea is that it means to be open and to be, to be free. So how does 
what happens on October 13th, how does that relate to that? I know we're just going a couple minutes over here. Maybe we could answer that question uh, tomorrow. And, and we can think about this line here and, and maybe people have a better way of understanding Shamgar. Okay, so let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. And I pray that you can bless each person throughout this day. You know the trials that we face, the struggles, and we need your help. We need your assistance. We need to be delivered uh, from uh, those things that oppress us. Help us, Lord, to trust in you. Be with us now throughout this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.